Um, it's um, certainly uncertain days, and so we've we've done a, a series. We did a thing on um, 2020 ambassadors with 2020 vision. We looked at uh, relating to our world and our culture, the world in, in which we live and society, and trying to view view society and view the days through the lens of the scripture, not the other way around. There are people that are trying to take and adjust the scripture to um, the current social climate and issues of the day, and it, uh, it just doesn't work. And the church really has, has, has lost its way in many respects. So um, we've been, we were looking at the culture and how we relate to the culture. I want to turn and, and really begin to look at something now in the next several weeks um, about the local church in our culture, about our life, our vision together as an assembly. And there's a passage here in Acts chapter 20 um, that I have long loved and appreciated. And we're not going to go through it verse by verse. We're really kind of going to go through it topically. Uh, but I encourage you to read and, and to get familiar with it and to read uh, Acts chapter 20 verses 17 through 38 and then read the book of Ephesians and then read the book of First Timothy. Because as you read those three books, there's a connection to them. Um, you can read Acts chapter 19 too where, where the apostle comes in and he founds and he establishes the church in that region of Asia. And uh, you, have the, you have the church in Asia, the churches, Colossae and Ephesus and different groups that were Laodicea that were established there. And then Paul travels. Now he comes back and he meets with the Ephesian elders here. And uh, it's a very touching passage that really talks about his life and his ministry with them. And it's really a challenge because Paul is saying farewell. Uh, you get down to the end of the chapter, um, or actually he mentions it in the chapter also, where um, he's not going to be back. He knows that he's heading to Jerusalem. He knows that there's uncertainty there. Um, but he knows that he's not going to see these men any longer. And these men have been leaning on him. Um, he was tremendously influential in their life. He was leading them. He had a tremendous ministry there. And he's basically saying farewell. And he's passing the baton and giving the ministry now to them. And th th these, these men here, um, we have Paul's touching farewell. We have the epistle that he wrote to, these, to this church in our Bible. The book of Ephesians writes it a little bit later. And then we have First and Second Timothy, where Paul writes about, he writes to Timothy, who is an elder at Ephesus, and then also writes about the, the, the departure. He says, all they that are in Asia be turned away from me. And we see, we, well, while we read this passage, we know how the story plays out. And there's just a, a real challenge, I think, for us as a local church, a local church family, to think about the future. Um, we're, we, we sit here in 2020 and we, we look at the world around us and uh, I, I don't know about you but I came back after the shutdown with a, with, a, with a renewed zeal and a renewed passion about our church and our ministry and uh, you know I'm thinking you know maybe I have 20 years left I tell that to my wife and she laughs but who knows but the, the, but the future is uncertain I think about Berean Bible Church 20 years from now what's the ministry going to look like Several of us are on, you know, we have, we're making the turn on the back nine, I like to say. Some of us are teeing it up on the, the, the 10th hole. Some of us the 15th or 16th, some of the 18th. I don't know. Um, we're all at different points, but the ministry will look different in 20 years. And I, I've been, been thinking, and, and really we need to be preparing for the future now. Um, we have another generation coming behind us. We have, um, and who knows what the country is going to look like, but Louisville needs Berean Bible Church in 20 years to still have a strong testimony. The Canton area needs Berean Bible Church to have a strong testimony in, in 20 years. We have another generation following behind us, my children, and not, then a generation behind them, grandchildren. Who knows what they're going to face in 20 uh, 2040, 2050, 2060. So the Lord tarry, so that golden daybreak not come. Uh, ministry goes on, and there needs to be a testimony. There needs to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. And so as we as we think about where we are as a as a local church, we need to be thinking about the future. 
And uh, what, what, what we have here is we have Paul to the Ephesian elders. This morning I want to talk to you about the elders at Ephesus and the principle of eldership. Uh, probably won't get all the way through the things that I want to share with you, but I just want to just lay some background about the leadership, the, 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 the uh, element of leadership in the local church. And I think in terms of, of where we are, we need to be cultivating leaders for the days ahead. Uh, we need to have, have men and women in place and, and laboring as time goes on. It's interesting, I was, I was reading 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy last night before I go to bed. I try to do that. And uh, there's these individuals that are mentioned in 1 and 2 Timothy. And I'm thinking, now, are those some of the elders that, he, that, that maybe are unnamed here in this chapter? Men that had departed from the faith. A man named Onesiphorus, he says he ministered to Paul when he was at Ephesus. Great things. Onesiphorus had died. And he tells Timothy to go, go you know, visit the family and, and encourage the family. So life goes on and, tra and, and change happens. People move. People get sick. We don't, we don't have any, any assurance. But there's a, there's, a, there's a real need for us, and, and so I'm going to be sharing some things about this passage, and I'd like to just challenge all of us to be thinking about, uh, about the ministry of our local church and our, and our time as we go forward. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to study and consider these things, and I pray that as we look into this passage that truly conveys the heart of the Apostle Paul for the local church and for the leadership of the local church and the ministry of the local church. We pray that we would gain a sense of the, of the urgency and the issues that, uh, that face us as we continue our life and our ministry together as a church family. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, this passage begins in verse 17. Paul is traveling and he says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And so this passage here, Paul is talking to the leadership of the men. Um, Miletus was, a, was, was some distance from Ephesus, and he was traveling, but he, wanted, he made a special effort to call these men, the leaders of the, of the, the church at Ephesus, together because he wanted, to, he wanted to, to spend some time with them as he passed the area heading on in his journeys. And so the, the issue of the elders here in the assembly, church leadership and church government, is, uh, is something that um, a lot of different ideas about it, um, traditional things, have, have most local churches set up like a corporation. They have the professional, they have the, 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 the pastor, and then they have the, the elder board, and then they have the congregation, kind of set up like a, like a corporation, a CEO and, and board of directors, and then the stockholders and so on. Um, but the, the actual design in scripture is different than that. And I remember as I was thinking about ministry and early on in my life in ministry, I was exposed to some of these things. And I remember just because it sounded different than that traditional view of the pastor. Um, but uh, through the process of time, actually the early 90s after we came here, I came to understand some things about this passage that, that really revolutionized my life. I had the traditional viewpoint and was intimidated by the the prospect of having ministry, then I took the job <laughs> and began to realize, and then, then I go to a new, a new church congregation and looked at, looked at as, the, as the man, you know, and uh, uh, had a little hiccup in, in those early days, and I remember Stefan's dad giving me some counsel. He says, instead of you acting by yourself, maybe, maybe speak for the, for the group. And uh, so, so if, the, if there's slings and arrows, you don't have to take them all by yourself. <laughs> and I remember how comfort that was. But then as I began to see these things, there is a, the principle of a plurality of leadership in a local church. You see the term elders there? There are three terms that are used. There is the term elder. There is the term bishop or overseer. And then there's the term pastoring or, or the pastor. Um, you see the term elders there? Um, that's a, that's a, a Greek word means an older man, an experienced man, a man of, of, of age and, and uh, uh, time and experience. Then if you look over to verse 28, Paul talking to the same group of men, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That word overseers 
is a different word that describes the same man. It's the word that we see elsewhere, the word bishop, which refers to the office and actual position that is held in, in ministry. So you, and, and, and then you have the, the function here in verse 28, um, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the, holy, the flock, the word pastor means a shepherd. It means somebody that cares and feeds the, 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 a flock of sheep. Well, it's a, it's a spiritual truth about the care and the oversight of a, of a local church. Uh, take heed to yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The care and feeding and protection of the flock. And as I, as I study these things, we're gonna, I want to show you how, that, how it came to that conclusion. It's really a group of men that pastor a church together. And within that group, there are different levels of skill and maturity and understanding. And it, I just want to show you, that, show you that, that concept. The term elder, like so many things in the scripture, is an Old Testament term. Come back with me to the book of Exodus. And I want to just show you where this, where this term comes from. Go to the book of Exodus chapter number 3. Um, Exodus chapter number 3. And um, what you have here in, in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is sent to Israel. He is, he is commissioned to go and, and to lead Israel out of Egypt. And in, in Exodus chapter number 3, just verse 16, Moses is told, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on. Moses is to, he's commissioned by God. He's sent to the elders of Israel. There were elders in Israel before Israel was a nation, before their birth. It's a very natural thing that Israel was made up of 12 tribes. And there were men, there were older men in Israel out of each of the tribes that had influence and that, that, that helped manage the affairs and, and govern the nation. And they were, they were looked to. And so Moses is, is said, go gather the elders and tell them what's, what's about to happen. Um, go to Exodus chapter number 4, verse 29. <coughs> Excuse me. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 29. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And then they, they do the signs and they, 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 they produce the, um, the, the signs and wonders about what is taking place. And the people understand what's taking place. And the battle is on between God and Pharaoh with Moses being the, 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 uh, the, the human instrument there. My point is, is that, that the, there was a structure. There was some influence. There were some men in Israel that were sprinkled throughout the, throughout the nation, even before it was a nation. You're talking about two million people. And they couldn't send out an email. They, didn't, they couldn't post it on the news. <laughs> um, what they did, it had to travel word of mouth. And so there were men that, that were leaders in Israel that, that, that dispensed that information within the nation. Um, go to Exodus chapter number 12. There are all, all the plagues take place, and they, the, the last plague is the Passover. And uh, that was the biggie. Um, ex Exodus chapter number 12, verses 1 through 20, is where the, the, pass the details of the Passover is given to Moses. And Moses is told by God what is, what is to take place, how it, is to, how it is to be administered. And then in verse 21, Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. So Moses meets with a group of men communicates the details to them and then they go and scatter out among the nation and communicate the details of exactly how that Passover is to be is to be carried out because if you don't do it right guess what the death angels coming in the door and gonna gonna smite the family so there's a there's a group of men that are that are, that are ministering and, and administering the, the affairs of the nation go to Exodus chapter number 18 so the concept comes out of the Old Testament, the term. And really, that's what you do with your Bible. When you see, when you see a word used, it'll be used elsewhere in the Scripture. You can hunt the word and in, a, in a dictionary, Bible dictionary of concordance. But what, a, what an exciting thing to just chase the rabbit and, uh, and, and, and to trace the to word through it. It's so easy now with your phone. You can type in the word elder. and You don't have this big concordance on your, on your desk. You can just, and you can hunt. It's an amazing, amazing day that we live in. But Israel, at this point, has come out of Egypt, and they're journeying towards Mount Sinai. And in Exodus chapter 18, Moses, his hands are full. 
Um, Exodus chapter 18, he's basically taken care of two million people. Anytime there's a disagreement, anytime there's a question, the line forms to the left of Moses and, and people are lined up and Moses is overwhelmed. Um, Exodus chapter number 18 verse 17, Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and I will be with thee. And thou be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moses, you teach. You be the spokesman. But as far as administering all the affairs and the, and the disputes and the, the questions that come up among two million people, he says in verse 21, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of the people able men. And there's three categories here. Men that, such as fear God, men of truth, hating co covetousness, and place them over them to be rulers of thousands, to be rulers of hundreds, to be of rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. Spread out the responsibility, Moses. And, and here, it's, it's, it's fascinating, the three qualities, fear of God, um, a respect for the things of the Lord and, and to, to people would know who, who had a, a real fear of God versus people that were just going through the motions he says men of truth not people that just go along to get along but men of principle men of absolutes and, and people want to do things the right way and then he says hating covetousness See the character issues there? This is a guy, the, these are guys that aren't in it for themselves. Don't want their own nest feathered. They're, they're content, they're, they're, they're simple-minded, and they're not going to abuse the influence that they have. And so you see these men that are chosen. They're, they're called rulers. Now this is not rulers in the sense of dominion. They're not kings. They're judges. Um, they bear the burden with Moses. Verse 23, if thou do this thing, um, God command thee so, then thou, thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall go to their place in peace. Verse 25, Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads of the people, rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds. Verse 26, and they judged the people at all seasons. They were, they were arbiters, and they would settle disputes and settle issues and manage the affairs of the nation. And so he sets these things up prior to the establishment of the priesthood and the Levites. Uh, there's actually elders within the elders, a special class of men that are going to work hand in hand with Moses. Um, come to Exodus chapter 19. So they, they get to Mount Sinai and the law is going to be given. Exodus 19 verse 7, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Now you think about that. They didn't have copies of the scriptures. They, they did all of this verbally. So Moses, is, he calls the elders, gives them the words, and then the, the elders go and they communicate those things to the people in the instructions. This thing is beginning to carry out and beginning to function, function and go. Um, go with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Those, that, that structure was set up in the very early days of Israel and how Israel began to function. But that first generation died off, didn't they? They, all, we, they, they, they set up the tabernacle and got the tabernacle up, up and going. They made the journey to Canaan. The spies went in. And, of course, the bad report. And God had to stop the progress. And that first generation died in the wilderness. When you get to the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is now 40 years older. <laughs> He's 120. <laughs> and you have the last year, really the last six months or so, 30, 30 days maybe, of, of Moses' life. And now Moses is talking to the next generation. 
mom and dad, the el that first generation of elders, have fallen in the wilderness. Now the children that watch the Red Sea part, they have grown up. They're in their, their, their uh, 20s to, to, to 40s. Um, and so now Moses is talking and he's looking back at that time. He says in verse 9, I spake unto you at that time, saying, I'm not able to bear my, you myself alone. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven. Um, verse 20, verse 12, how can I myself, uh, how can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? <laughs> See, there was, there was, the nation of Israel were murmuring and complaining right along. So we, verse 13, Take you wise men and understanding and known among the tribes, and I will make you make, make them rulers over you. Interesting, a little more information here. Wisdom. There's some experience involved and, and some, some skill and some, some life experiences. And understanding and known. This is this is to, that word known works both ways. They knew the people. <laughs> Because they were, they were members of the family, they knew the people, and the people knew them. And so there's this, there's this familiarity with them. And so when Moses selected those men out, they would have, it, it's kind of like a nominating process. The people would have accepted them because they, they, they knew their reputation and the, and the quality of their life. And so they're placed in this, in this structure. And what I, my point is here that that Moses is reiterating this same process now to a new generation who's getting ready to go into the land and fight the battles of war and the, and the, and the struggle there. Um, verse 15, so I took chief of your tribes, wise men and, and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, um, officers, the end of verse 15. And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brother, and then judge righteously between every man and his brother, and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And if the cause be too hard for you, bring it to me. Notice the equality in the respect of persons there. The small and the great, the brethren, the national members of the family, and the stranger. One law for all. And these men are, are the, the, together, they are the political structure of the nation of Israel here. And of course then you also have the religious leaders, the priests are, and, and so on, that are set up. My point is, is this term elder, it refers to age and experience and recognition by the people it, 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 it talks about wisdom. It's, they're, they're recognized and they're known. And there's a group of men here. That gives you the concept of the, of the elders. Come with me to, um, 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 come over to the, to the book of Acts, chapter number 20. And uh, that concept was even existed at the time of Christ in the, uh, in the nation of Israel. There were the chief priests, the religious class, the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the elders. It's still recognized that there is a, there's a class of people within Israel that are looked to and that are part of the administration uh, of the affairs of the nation. Um, we see elders oftentimes sat in the gate in the Old Testament, like in the book of Ruth, when the, the whole process between Ruth and Boaz and the kinsman redeemer was brought up. It was brought before the elders of the gate and they, they were witnesses and they made judgment. So this term elder has a rich meaning and has a concept to it. Now as we, as we see the, the, New, the New Testament concept is in place, notice um, Acts chapter 20 once again and verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, plural, of the church, singular. Now they're could possibly have been more than one church at Ephesus, and Paul is talking collectively of the church at Ephesus, but it seems to indicate to me, and the pattern is seen elsewhere in the scripture, that if there's a plurality of men within the local church called elders that would match the elders of the Old Testament just in a, in a New Testament concept. 
contents. And so as you see these things, these elders here in verse 17, the same men in verse 28 are called overseers, are called bishops. Paul says in 1 Timothy, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. The same, see the same term is applied, or different terms are applied to the same man. The term elder would, would take the man and talk about his experience, his age, and his wisdom. The word bishop or overseer would, be, would refer to his office and his position and his authority in the assembly. The word pastor, like pastors and teachers, those were gifts that were given, would refer to their function. And together you see, you see how those, those men operated and they worked. And in the early church in these days here, you had gifts too. You had apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers. You had supernaturally gifted men that worked together in the local church and managed and taught and ministered to the people. So you, so you see those things operating uh, repeatedly. I want to show you some examples of this. Go to, go to Acts chapter number 13. And I just want to um, show you how the, the traditional view of a pastor, of, of a one-man ministry or one-man leadership, really doesn't match the, the, um, the perspective in the scripture repeatedly over and over again. Acts chapter 13. Here's the, 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 where the Christians were called, they were called Christians first at Antioch. This is the, the first grace church of Antioch. Acts 13 verse 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had brought up, been brought up with the Herod the Tatriarch, and Saul. There's at least five men individually that were listed there carrying on the ministry at the church at Antioch. They were ministering together. They had different authority. They had different perspective. And they're carrying on the ministry there. Barnabas was a member of the little flock. Um, Paul was, was, the, was the great apostle. And, and then others that are there. And then you know what you see what happens? The two top guys leave. <laughs> They're separated and they begin to go out in the, the apostolic journeys in chapter 13 and chapter 14. Paul is traveling and he's gone for several years. And the ministry doesn't skip a beat. Takes the top two guys out of the, out of the, the local church and the church goes on and functions. It's, just, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. Go to Acts chapter 14. Paul, as he's on his first journey, goes into the region of Galatia. This is where the Galatian churches were established, that, that the book of Galatians is written to a, a cluster of churches there. And he's, he's carrying on ministry in Lystra um, and Iconium and Derbe and that, that region there. Um, he, is, he is in Derbe now, Acts 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, there's evangelism. Paul had a public testimony seeing people get saved and coming to the, the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as salvation. The gospel to that city and had taught many. There's edification. Get people saved, begin to teach them the Bible, teach them the scripture. And then when he returned to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples. There's establishment and exhorting them to continue in the faith, encouraging them, urging them into motion, challenging them for life and ministry, evangelism, edification, exhortation, go out and serve the Lord, <laughs> um, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders, plural, in every church, singular, and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. And after they had passed on Pisidian, they came to Pamphylia. How Paul establishes leadership there and moves on. An independent, functioning, self-functioning local assembly in all those different cities. It's a great thing. That's what ministry is. We go out and we preach the gospel. We present the issue of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
died on a cross and was buried and rose again the third day, people need to get saved. They need to have that, that need of their heart being met so that they know that they, they have eternal life. Amen. And they, they, they have that issue settled. But between eternal life and heaven, there's the ugly now and now. You need to take God's word and build it into the lives of people and edify them and establish them and ground them in the faith. Teach them and, and build them up in the faith and, and challenge them to encourage and, and go forward in, in life and in ministry. There's life together that we share. And then around that life that we share, there's structure. There's this term, elders, that are established. Overseers to together pastor the assembly, the structure. You see how that, how that works and how that plays out. Go to uh, Acts chapter 15. There's the church at Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15 and verse 22. Now this is the little flock, but you see the same principle. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Uh, namely Judas and Barsabas and Silas, chief men among the brethren. You see apostles, those are those special men with the special authority and elders there, a group of men working with, with, the, with the congregation and the people. Come to the book of Philippians. We saw, we've, we've seen the Ephesian church was set up that way. Go to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number one. The church at Philippi was established on Paul's second journey. And uh, it was a city in Macedonia. Philippians chapter 1 verse 1. And Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, comma, with the bishops, there's the overseers, and deacons, there's the other office. The oversight, it, this, these men were elders, but Paul here just uses the term bishop to, ex, to express the idea of office. It was a recognized place and, and ministry. You see the plurality there? With the bishops and deacons, a group of men having oversight over the assembly. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Thessalonica was established, it was a local church that was established in Acts 17. Paul was there for a short time and then moved on to, to Athens and Corinth and, and, and the, the, the ministry in Asia. And this, this Thessalonian church was established and Paul had to leave shortly after he was there. Look at what he says in chapter 5 and verse 11. Here's local church life, beloved. He says, wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. You know, in the midst of suffering and persecution, um, this church was tremendously persecuted and tremendous affliction. You know what the saints had to do? They had to comfort themselves together. They met. They didn't have to meet virtually. <laughs> they didn't use Zoom. They had to gather and have the, the eyeball to eyeball, the interaction, support, and encouragement in tough times what he says for the church there verse 12 and we beseech you brethren to know them which labor among you see the plurality of men the, the men that are laboring among the congregation they're part of it they're not above it they're not a, a hierarchy a special class and are over you in the Lord there's the overseers and admonish you. There's the, 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 the edification. He says in verse 13, And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. My point is, you see how there's a plurality of men that's associated with each assembly? Sometimes we can see these men, and we can associate different men with different places. They're, they're referred to and associated. Multiple men in multiple places carrying on life and ministry. One more. Come to the book of Titus, chapter 1. Titus, chapter 1. My, my point is, is this, this design of a multitude of men ministering within a congregation is the scriptural pattern. Um, Titus, chapter number 1, 
verse 5. Here's Paul writing to Titus. He's, in, he's on the island of Crete. And he says in verse 5, For this cause left I thee at Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. Groups of men, multitude of men, multiple men that labor together within the assembly. As I appointed thee. Gives some qualifications there in verse 6. Verse 7. For a bishop. There's the overseer. There's the office. See how the same men, the same men are called elders in verse 5, are now called bishops in verse 10. There's the office and there's the authority. This is the very end of Paul's life and ministry. At the very beginning, at, at Antioch in Acts 13, all the way to the, 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 the close of his life, the pattern is still the same. And it's a wonderful pattern. It's how local church life is carried on. And there was a plurality of men that pastored the local church together. Now, now back up to the book of 1 Timothy. I want to show you one verse here that uh, really kind of tied it all together for me. Um, I remember seeing this, seeing the, as I'm studying these things, and it took such a burden off of my shoulders because I began to realize that I don't have to do it all. I don't have to bear all the responsibility. I need to look to others, other men, and, and, to, and to share the labor together. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. There are three levels of ministry within this group of elders. It's very touching. Notice the three groups here. 1 Timothy chapter number 5 and verse 17. He says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now you clearly, you can see two classes there, can't you? He says, the laborers, the laborers that rule well are counted worthy of double honor. There's financial support. Especially they that labor in the word and doctrine. There are two groups, two, two types of elders that are spoken there, of there that are worthy of financial support if they have to give more of their time to ministry and the affairs of the local church. But then there's that, it says, verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. There's a well-ruling elder <laughs> that's worthy of financial support. But then there would be elders that would be kind of just in the background. Have a quiet, maybe less public, maybe less prominent ministry that doesn't require the time or the responsibility or the, the obligation so there's elders that are, that are within the assembly, older men that are, have responsibility and oversight, and then there's elders that rule well, that have added responsibility, maybe a youth pastor, or if you have a school, the administrator of a school, and he's a, 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 overseeing, if it's a large, true, large group, maybe you have responsibility over Sunday school and youth ministry or visitation or counseling. And then you have, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. There's the full-time guy who gives himself wholly and completely to the study of the scriptures because on a regular basis he's the primary teacher and leader in the assembly. And he says, he and the other elders that rule well are, are worthy to be supported because of their work and because of their labor. But all of the elders are laboring and working in the work of the ministry. My, my point is there's, there's not a one-size-fits-all. That, that, that's a beautiful illustration. It allows for diversity within the group. It allows for different experiences and different, different desires and difference of, difference of ability, difference of, of experience and knowledge and understanding and desire. Maybe there's somebody that wants to give themselves to the full-time ministry and the study of the word and the preaching of the word and the laboring. 
But maybe there's others that, you know, that's just not for me. There's, uh, there's public ministry and there's private ministry. Go back to, go back to uh, Acts chapter number 20. This is beautiful. Acts chapter 20. Notice how Paul's ministry and how he conducted his life there at Ephesus. Um, he says in verse 19, Acts 20 verse 19, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, he lived it, he demonstrated it in their midst, and have taught you, he communicated, he had a, he had a teaching ministry publicly and from house to house. Paul had a public ministry where, where he taught the, 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 the saints as they gathered as a group. And yet he also had house to house, private, personal interaction with the saints. Maybe saints needed more, in, more, more personal instruction or, or, or personal attention. And see, see how, how that allows for variation within the leadership. You can have people that, that, that maybe I'm not the public guy. I can't stand in front of a, a, a group of people and teach. I, it's just not for me. But I can have a private ministry. I can deal one-on-one. -on -one, and I can use my experience and my knowledge and my understanding and my influence and try to come along and support the weak, encourage the saints, exhort, counsel, minister. What this does is, it, without looking to one man to do it all, you have this wonderful balance and diversity. You have, a, you have a cluster of men within the assembly that maybe one man is easier to identify with this person here. I could go, go to him because I identify with him. I'd be more comfortable talking with him as opposed to the public guy. <laughs> public guy might use me as a sermon illustration sometime, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know. But you see how beautiful that is? Public and, and private ministry and counseling and, and exhortation. And it, it allows for diversity within the elders. You know that there's very few guys that can do everything. You know, the superstar. The, you know, there's, there's some of them out there that can, that can music and can do... Uh, counseling and can do preaching and can do counseling and, and travel and do all of that. But different men have strengths and weaknesses. Other men have, uh, another man might have a strength and might have, might have experience and compassion because of his experience. And he can, he can compensate for an area that I'm ignorant in. And see, that there's this balance and there's this working together. Instead of a CEO and board members and stockholders, it's really more like a family, like a marriage, you know? Husbands and wives, aren't they different? And yet they have strength and they have perspective and they have balance. And guys, if you're smart, you listen. <laughs> but you know, honey, ma'am, if you're smart, you'll listen too. And there's this give and take. And together, you're one new person. And that demonstrates the oneness that exists in marriage. The local church is the oneness of a body. Not a corporation, not a machine, not a business, but spiritual life. You've got the hand, and you've got the foot, and you've got the ear, and you've got the eye, and you've got, got the, the arm. And all these different parts do what? They work together as one. And the, the elders, the leadership of the assembly together, pastor, care for, administer the needs of a congregation. Because there's, there's not a need for a one size fits all. There's shared responsibility, different pr presentation, different delivery, <laughs> different illustrations. I hear Tara. As she listens to the radio program, she finishes the sentences before I even get to the end, right? Some of you can do that too. You know what I'm going to say. We've been, I've been saying for 30 years. But there's, you know, if you have a, a variance of testimony, <laughs> you're not always listening to the same tone of voice, the same life experiences. There's diversity and there's, there's this wonderful balance that exists. Different skill level, different knowledge, different strengths shared responsibility and ministry 
and oversight all laboring, supporting, and compensating for each other, and the work of the ministry goes on. It's a beautiful thing. And here we are in 2020, some of us are on the back nine. And where is the ministry going to be in 20 years or 30 years? We have a unique opportunity, while some of us are still on the course, <laughs> to cultivate and to bring along the next generation of leaders. Frankly, we've just kind of wanted to wait and see if it would happen. But I think there's a need for us to really start pooling our resources and thinking about how we can cultivate shared life and shared ministry while these young guys and gals can learn while we're still around. <laughs> and there's a, there's a, because you know, in 2040, Louisville, Alliance, Canton are going to need Berean Bible Church as the pillar and the ground of the truth. Amen? And we take this same truth and the same message and we commit it to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. And not only does our community need the pillar and the ground of truth and the testimony of the gospel, the grace of God, the next generation does. The children that are coming along and their children, they need in such uncertain times and chaotic times. You think things are bad now? Guess what Paul says about the perilous times? He says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. There's going to be an even greater need. And if we don't begin to, to, to really plan for the future, there's going to come a day when guys are going to stand up and say, what do we do? Because you know, individuals aren't able to minister anymore. There's a real need, I think, to cultivate life and ministry, shared testimony together, our meeting together and the opportunity. The saints speaking the truth in love and the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The body of Christ ministering to each other. Everybody has a need to minister and to be ministered to. And there's something about, uh, there's something about that. We're going to talk about it in a week or two. There's a joy, an unexpected blessing about ministry and the sacrifice is the joy of watching God's word take root in people's lives and people's heart. And it's worth the sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice that has to be chosen and entered into. Now, I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on our younger men. I'm just saying I remember growing up my pastor, Pastor Floyd Baker, talking about the future and where is the ministry going to be? And I'm thinking, well, it's probably going to be somebody else. It's probably not going to be me. <laughs> but you know, as we give ourselves to God's word, the greatest ability is availability. And you don't compare yourself to other people. Because if you compare yourself to other people, and I have to do it like they do it, you're robbing the body of Christ of the particular aspects of your character and your personality, of Christ in you. And so it, it, uh, it comes back to, to taking God's word and studying God's word and God's word becoming life. And you share that life and that fellowship one to another and you're edified and you're built up. And you have a testimony and you have, a, have an example in the community. You have an example to those that come. So I want to look at, in the, in the next week, week to come, we're going to look at some things about how these elders function. And then we'll go down through the passage kind of topically and look at some of the things about local church life, about Paul's concern and how he, how he conducted and, and carried on himself. But um, these things are, 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 are tremendously practical for us in these days in which we live. And uh, God help us to, uh, to stand... And, uh, and stand and commit the gospel, the grace of God, to the next generation. But it first has to work in our own personal lives, doesn't it? And uh, that's where Paul says, study to show thyself. Take heed to thyself. It starts each and every one of us investing time in God's word, but then it also requires the saints to come alongside, put the arm around and say, I can help you, I can encourage you and we minister one to another.
a great joy. What a special thing we have as a local church. And uh, I'm hoping that we can um, progress and, and learn how to make the most of it. Uh, because he says, redeem the time, doesn't he? Redeem. We don't know how much more time the Lord's going to give us. In, you know, it's been pretty, pretty amazing thing, and I guess I, I need to quit. I get to get to kind of rambling here at the end, but, but um, life will change on a dime. You know, we could come to church next week, and somebody dying in a car accident, or personal infirmity and whatnot, and uh, life changes. But we need to have our, our, our ministry and our, our strength together in, uh, in our life and our assembly. Amen? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the time we can spend together and consider these things. And uh, Lord, it starts with our relationship with you. We thank you so very much that you saved us by simple faith in your son, by resting in what, what was accomplished for us there on the cross. And then, Father, as we... As we rest and rejoice in that, then we get into God's word and we find out all that that opens up to us and that lives and works in us and it lives and works in one another. And we enjoy fellowship and we enjoy ministry together. What a joy, what a privilege. And Lord, as we, as we go forward, may we each of us look at how we can contribute to the life and the ongoing ministry of our local church and our local church family as we invest in one another for your honor and glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.